Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Stacy Walter. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager here with Herman. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today. Um, we're going to talk about the CARES Act, and as many of you know, there's a couple of new versions out which our presenter will take us through today. And um, I just want to remind you all, as part of this, if you have any questions about products or so forth, please feel free to reach out to your Herman Sales representative and they'll be happy to jump on a call with you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kaylee and she is the sales territory sales manager for Legrand and she's going to take it over and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. We can take questions as we go along. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kaylee Luke. As Stacy said, I am a territory sales manager for Legrand AV. Um, I cover the Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Panhandle region. So there's tons of me for Legrand AV across the, the nation. So hopefully you have been able to connect with either myself or, or my counterparts. Um, I do cover all the Legrand AV brands, which include C2G, former Cables to Go, uh, Daylight, Chief, Luxel, Vadio, Middle Atlantic, and Wiremold. So seven different brands that are all available to you uh, through our wonderful partnership with Herman. Um, so as Stacy mentioned, if you have any questions about brands or products, um, feel free to reach out to your Herman rep and or your Legrand AV rep. So without further ado, let's jump into today's session, which is uh, about CARES Act, the CRRSA, and ARPA, and what all those mean, um, and what's different and how you um, can partner with the schools to make sure that they're you know, continuing on education. And more importantly, with this, this last round, the focus really is to get students back up to speed um, after this, this you know, pandemic year. So let's dive in. We'll start out with uh, just the federal funding. We're really going to be honing in on the education stabilization fund resources. So with all of these acts, there's definitely different portions of budgets going to, to several different, um, you know, governing factors. It could be state, local government, federal government. Um, it could be for the medical field, but we're really focusing on education today. And then we're gonna jump into some of the AV trends and needs that we've been seeing uh, across the nation. What, what makes our phone ring? What are we hearing from integrator um, partners such as yourself? What are we hearing from the K-312 schools and the higher ed institutions? We'll explore those spaces and what those trends um, lead to as far as solutions. And then we'll end with some resources that we have available for you at Legrand AV. Um, I'll have my email at the end, so if there's any particular thing that uh, tickles your fancy, feel free to reach out and send me an email, and I'll make sure that uh, any of the tools or uh, information that I talk about today, I, I can send to you. Um, I did see in the chat if the PowerPoint would be available uh, for uh, after after the webinar, absolutely. Again, you can reach out to me, or I can send everything to Stacy too, so that Herman has it, so you can you can get it through them as well. So let's jump in. Um, first, uh, I want to kind of level set. So I'm going to be talking in a lot of different acronyms, uh, thanks to our federal government. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and and understanding what I say when I say all these, these letters. So there are three rounds of funding that we'll be covering. And uh, the first round, hopefully you guys are all aware of, uh, and maybe you're cared out about CARES, but I'm really hoping that this, this session gets you excited about what's to come, what, what just passed, um, and, and what that means for years to come, right? So for, for CARES, that is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Um, the latest or the one that the latest as far as funding already becoming available is the CRRSA, and that's the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. Um, that was actually signed into law back in December. Um, funding started coming through at the end of January, February timeframe. 
And then the latest, which we haven't seen funding come from this one quite yet, and the details are still a little blurry. So we'll, we'll definitely keep you posted if you come to LeGrandAV.com. We've got a lot of wonderful blogs and resources. Um, as we find out more about this latest, this ARPA, um, you, can, you can educate yourself on that as well. And that is the American Rescue Plan Act. So those are the three rounds of funding. Um, there are three major funding areas in each of these rounds. So uh, the, the overarching one is the Education Stabilization Funding Area, or the ESF. Um, so one of, there, there's technically five areas of funding here, but we're really only going to focus on three because two of them, which I'll highlight a little bit later, only make up 1% combined of the overall education stabilization fund. So we really want to put, um, you know, hone in and, and, and kind of make sure that you understand the three biggest um, components of it. And that is ESSER which is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. There's GIRF, which is the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund. And then there's HIRF, which is the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund. And then underneath those, there's the education agencies. So there's the IHEs, which is the Institution of Higher Education, and these are getting direct federal awards. So with CARES, um, they were able to apply for federal funding, and if awarded, uh, then you know, it came directly from the federal government down to these higher ed institutions. And the second wave, the CRRSA, if the higher ed um, institutions receive funding the first round, they automatically received it the second round. So there is nothing more that they, they have to do. If a higher ed institution did not apply for the first round though, it doesn't mean that they are gonna be left out the second round. They can apply for the CRRSA, although those applications are needed here quickly. By April 15th, they need to submit. And, um, and hopefully there's, there's funding available and they get approved and they, they'll get some allocation. If no other higher ed institutions apply, then those, uh, those funds set aside for, for those that didn't get it the first round will be reallocated out to other higher ed institutions. And then there is the SEA. So this is really diving into the K through 12 space, the ESSER, and even the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund. So those funds go to SEAs or the state education agencies. So again, kind of the direct federal awards and uh, basically, those SEAs are tasked with setting up uh, the, the subgrants that abide by the federal regulation. So um, whatever those subgrants are, it varies by state. Some have three subgrants, some have eight. It, it just it can vary by state. And what that process is um, for those LEAs to apply for those subgrants, that's also set up by the SEAs. So the LEAs are the local education agencies. Um, and these can be, you know, city school systems, county school systems, ISDs, all of that. Um, one thing to note is the federal awards that the SEAs get, 10% of it, they can keep for themselves for admin purposes and then just kind of keep on the back burner so that they can reallocate or allocate out um, after a while. But the rest of it, the 90% that they receive do have to go to LEAs. So... Let's jump in here and um, we're gonna go back to the past. I think it's important to understand uh, what uh, was awarded in CARES to, to see you know, the impact and, and the opportunity that there is for the CRRSA and ARPA. So with that, here is the CARES Act funding and kind of how it, it's divvied up amongst, um, let me, put my mouse in the right area, how it's divvied up amongst the three main funding areas. So uh, it, it's roughly almost $31 billion worth of funds that were awarded in CARES Act just over a year ago. And uh, roughly five to 10% of that we saw on a spend for distance learning integrations or AV in general. So pretty good chunk and I'm hoping that you guys got some of that business and you were really just able to be a resource for the schools um, and help them out in this, you know, this kind of wave of uh, funding and this wave of pandemic and just this new world that they were kind of dealing with. Um, 
you know, most of that funding, uh, it, it is up a year from when it was dispersed out. Um, many states actually imposed a deadline of December 31st, 2020. That was not a federal imposition. That was a state imposition in order to ensure that, you know, if the schools do not use all of their funds, the state has time to take back the funds, reallocate to schools that will use it and give those schools time to purchase. So all of that is said to say this, there's actually still potentially some funding out there for CARES 1.0, probably not a lot, but it is still open until April, May timeframe, because that's when um, a lot of the, the, the funding was dispersed in the first round. So I wanna show you a really cool tool. Let's get that up and running. So this is, again, just for the first wave. So, and, and it's a little outdated, but I wanna, I wanna point this out because I'm really hoping that we see this same tool uh, in regards to the CRRSA. So the second round of funding that's coming out and potentially even the third round of funding that's coming out. It's just a really cool tool. Um, and as I said, it's a little outdated. So this is as of November 30th, 2020. And again, if a lot of states impose that December 31st, uh, 2020 deadline, I'm sure most of this has been spent. But what's really awesome about it is you, you see the overall states here, the darker the state, um, the more award, because that's what I have selected. If you do spend, it changes. Um, right now I have total and you can go to ESSER if you're more of a K through 12 focus partner. Um, or higher ed if you're more of a higher ed focused partner. But then you can dive into the state. And I'm going to pick Tennessee because that's where I live. Um, so what's really cool here is you basically can see what has been spent. And again, this is of November 30th, so a little outdated. But um, you can understand what the total award is and then the dollars spent. Over here, you can see how many LEAs are in the state. So local education agencies and how many subgrants um, were received by those LEAs. So remember, I mentioned that some states could have multiple subgrants, they could have eight, they could have three, whatever. That's why that number is usually greater than the number of LEAs. As far as higher ed institutions, um, you see that I have 153 in my state. Um, but only 128 received grants. So again, they, they, for the first round, they had to apply for these grants. Um, some schools opted not to because, you know, they would have to abide by federal regulation. They didn't want to have to do all the reporting on how they were spending it. They, you know, as a part of this, you know, they weren't allowed to reduce their staff and maybe that wasn't something that they were willing to negotiate on, right? So, um, those folks did not receive the federal funding. And it's important to note, again, um, the 128 that did in this state will automatically receive the second wave. Um, so with that, let's kind of dive down a little bit deeper here. You can see uh, this is the ESSER, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. You can see that only 31.5% was spent at the time of reporting, and that's pretty typical across all states. And again, it's just the process that the ESSER fund has to go through from the federal government to the state government, the state government, figuring out what those subgrants are in that process is, and then um, trickling down finally to the local education agencies. What I like to note here is one, you can, you can filter this basically so you can see um, and, and figure out who has the most. So Shelby County, um, if anyone's familiar with Tennessee is definitely the biggest education area for me. Um, and so they receive the most funding. What's really cool about this is, yeah, maybe all of their dollars are spent this time, but um, if they receive funding as subgrantees the first round, they're likely to go ahead and apply the second round because they already know how to do it. So uh, it, the subgrants may be different, but the process is likely going to be the same. So these could be target school areas for you to, to take a look at and go after. And again, just help them out and understand, especially now, not just let's make do and try to get through this pandemic year, let's also focus on the future with this next round and the, even the third round of funding. 
And you can do the same with the, the governor's emergency education relief. So you can see who was awarded what. Um, there are a little bit of caveats on the governor's this uh, for the CRRSA. So like I said in the in the ESSER, where if the schools know how to apply for the subgrants, maybe they're great targets because they're going to do it again. The governor's fund with those caveats, not really the case. Um, there's going to be an emphasis on private sector there. So the funds have to go to potentially different entities than what they did the first round. And this is where the data gets really cool. And this is the higher ed piece because you can actually see um, what the spend was per school, not just per you know, state here, the overall spend was 0.3 for the state of Tennessee on the governors at the time of reporting. This is actually per school what is spent. So if we see something like this tool for the CRRSA, a way that you could look at this is basically see how much was awarded. And maybe those are your, your targets right then and there. Um, the top, however many. But you know, a couple months down the road, maybe it's looking at how much of that award is spent. And if you go in, let's just look at UT Knoxville here. You can see that you know um, most, if not actually all of their student portion has been spent. But at the time of the reporting, the institutional portion only you know they they still have about seven million dollars out there. So. What student and institutional portion means is uh, the student portion is the financial aid. So in the first round, um, whatever was awarded to them in this in this particular portion of the higher ed funding. So there are Title V and Title VII areas out there. That's pretty low in most cases, as you can see at UT, they got none of that money. Um, but for this piece of the funding, 50% had to go to financial aid and the other 50% went to institutional. And the institutional is, I mean, that's the PPE, that's the sanitization, it's all of that good stuff, but that's also where we play um, as manufacturers, as um, distributors, and as integrator partners. Um, this is where the technology piece comes into play. Um, and that's where they can kind of dive into that bucket. So. Again, if you look out here, UT here only, I mean, they still had $7 million that they could potentially spend, which is, which is kind of cool. So again, if you would like access to this, if, hopefully you can kind of see what it is up here, but uh, send me an email, I'll have my email at the end and I can make sure that you have access to this tool. And then let's go back to the presentation. Okay, let's let's talk about the CRRSA now, the present. So this is the Coronavirus uh, Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021. This was passed by Congress on December 21st. It was signed uh, by the president in December 27th. But the reason why it's called 2021 is because the funds didn't um, become available until the end of January. So 30 days after it was signed into law. And you can see here that these uh, dollar amounts, and I'll have a better graphic that isn't uh, animated that kind of shows the comparison a little bit better, but you can see here that the, the CRRSA, there's a lot more dollars out there for all three of the major funding areas. And here we suspect that, you know, hopefully we'll see five to 15% go to distance learning or AV um, projects. And probably with the view of more of the future in mind. Uh, there are, again, some, some caveats with this one that uh, where they can be, where they can reimburse themselves from uh, expenses that they have incurred that maybe they weren't able or they ran out of their CARES Act 1.0 funds. They can leverage this new CRRSA um, area for those funds too. So we might miss out on a few. Um, pieces there and, and the AVIT teams at the schools may miss out on a few dollars there because of the fact that they can um, reimburse themselves. But again, we're, we're hoping to see five to 15%. And this is really the comparison. So this is where hopefully you get excited, right? So we've talked about CARES, we understand what happened there. Um, that was $30 billion worth of funding. 
the CRRSA is $81.88 billion worth of funding. So essentially two and a half times the size of the first round of CARES. And it's gonna expire in 930, 2022. That's the debt drop dead date, but most of the guidelines for ESSER, the GIRF and the, the HIRF are a year from disbursement of funds. Again, like what we saw in the first round. So very, very similar. And here's a breakdown. So we see here that ESSER this round becomes a much bigger um, piece of the pie. So the emphasis truly is on K through 12 for, for this round of funding. That being said, even though the higher ed portion is not quite as big percentage wise, they're still getting more money than what they got the first round. And then here's the governor's fund. And it, it's good to note that what we saw in the first round was a lot of the government governor's fund grants um, went to K through 12. And that was likely because the K through 12 got less than higher ed in the first round. But the focus again, really is on K through 12 in the second round. So we, we suspect that, you know, the governor is still gonna emphasize K through 12, um, even in the CRRSA. And here are the other two areas that I mentioned at the very beginning, there's a total of five, three major ones that we were really gonna dive in deep. Um, these two again, combined make up 1%. I do wanna hit on the 0.5% um, of Bureau of Indian Education. So they get federal funding every year anyways, but with this additional funding, it's essentially a 25% boost of what they typically get. So if you do have relationships with schools that fall under this realm, um, if they've been saying, I really wish I could do this, but I don't have the funds, well, maybe now they have the funds. So it might be a good time to revisit those um, particular schools. So we're gonna dive in. Um, into each of these a little bit deeper. Again, this is this is pertaining to the second round, the CRRSA. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the additional funds or the, the bump in funding compared to CARES, but also some of those, again, nuances that we're seeing, slight differences, things that you should be aware of. So for the governor's um, emergency education relief fund or the GIRF, the focus, as I mentioned um, earlier, is really on non-public schools. So roughly 67% or $2.75 billion of the overall $4 billion, which is up from the $3 billion that they received the first round, has to go to the non-public schools. Um, so definitely a shift and why I mentioned if you're utilizing that tool that I showed you from um, the Department of Education, Looking at who maybe received the governor's fund subgrants for the second first round to to know who to target in the second round for that particular segment probably not the best idea because of this new emphasis on on the private sector. Some of these use of funds, the typical again sanitizing PPE. Something that's a little newer is air purification and ventilation. So you may see some of the older schools that really need to um, upgrade this their, their air and their ventilation. Um, they're able to leverage and, and apply for subgrants um, to be able to use these funds for that. But there is a piece of, again, where we play, the technology to assist with remote learning. And there may be, depending on your line cards and, and everything that you do, there may be other areas within the use of funds that are relevant to you, but this is, this is the huge piece as far as AB is concerned. And now jumping into ESSER, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. So um, again, K through 12, this is solely K through 12, where governors could be a mix of K through 12 and higher ed, this is solely K through 12 you can see that it is much larger than CARES. So in CARES, ESSER only received just shy of 13.5 billion. In the second round, they're receiving over $54 billion. And it is a use it or return it in one year from the date of distribution. So it's still that guideline of one year. And so we'll probably see a lot of states do that imposition again of a deadline of year end or some sort of month and 
you know, that the schools have to have all of their funding spent by, otherwise the state will take it back, reallocate it to other schools and let those schools spend. So keep that in mind. The other big difference in this round is that um, essentially for CARES, it went from those SEAs, or well, the federal government to the SEAs, SEAs to LEAs, and those local education agencies could be like a superintendent, and then they're just saying, you know, okay, this elementary school, I think they need this, and we're going to, you know, dedicate funds for this, and this school, this elementary school, this elementary school, our intermediate school, our high school. In this round, they're really supposed to be um, working with the principals of the individual schools to address the actual needs of that particular school. So I bring that up to say, you know, if, if you have relationships with principals, now's a great time to reach out because they're gonna be tasked and they're gonna be asked, what are their needs and how are they gonna, how do they want to spend this chunk of dollars? And it's a good, you know, it's a good opportunity for you to kind of swing in there and, and help them out, help them understand what they can and should be doing. And here's the higher ed piece. So like I said, it, it's not as big of a piece of the overall pie, but they're still getting more dollars than what they, they received in the first round. So just over 14 billion in CARES. Um, and for the CRRSA, just shy of 23 billion. There is a de-emphasis on um, online schools. So like think of a University of Phoenix or, or schools like that. They still, if they receive money the first round, they'll still receive some money, but they're not going to receive as much money as they did the first round, where as other tip, like, you know, normal universities and colleges, they're probably going to receive more. The other piece of this is, remember in the first round, 50% of um, the good, good chunk of that education stabilization of the HERF, um, 50% had to go to financial aid, 50% to the institutional. Um, in this round, that is not the case, but they at least have to give the same amount of financial aid as what they did the first round. So they could give more, they could still do the 50%, but at minimum, they have to give the same amount of what they did in the first round. And a majority of the funds will be sent in 30 days after it became law. So a majority of the funds are already out there. So that was into January, February timeframe. And what I've seen and what I've heard from my colleagues and just what we're seeing in general is, you know, it's not the knee jerk reaction that we saw last year and just like, let's buy as many cameras as we can. It's, it's really a, a more planful approach and it looks like it's going to follow the typical purchasing and um, education um, uh, cycle that we normally see. So making these decisions now, purchasing probably in late spring, and then installation over the summer months. There is also, again, the, the pieces of how the funds can be used, and it is PPE, it is sanitization, here's the technology piece. Here's where I mentioned at the beginning that they can be reimbursed for incurred expenses, so something a little bit newer. Um, they cannot use the funds for recruitment, capital outlay of athletics, and salaries for senior admin, but they can use it for payroll. Again, as part of the federal regulations, they really needed to maintain their staff, and that's kind of what they signed up for. And here is kind of the chunk of the, just the here, the higher edge education piece. And so when I mentioned 50% financial aid for the first round, 50% institutional, and then the second round, there's still that component of institutional and financial aid, that's where all of this is. So it is uh, the biggest piece of the pie here, but there are some other sections. So if you remembered looking at the tool that I showed you before, if you looked at TSU in my area, um, it looked like there was a lot more money um, that was available. We don't know what the full spend was for these Title V and Title VII pieces. So um, certain universities and colleges may receive this funding in addition to what they receive here. So let's talk about the future. Let's talk about ARPA, the American Rescue Plan of um, 2021. So this was this is brand new. Um, I will be honest, we, we, we dove in 
Um, but because it is so new, um, the information is still coming to us. So like I said, if you just go to lagrandeadie.com, um, we have a lot of wonderful landing pages that I'll share with you. And as we find out more information, we'll definitely update those pages with this ARPA information. But here is what we currently know. I'm actually gonna take a step back. Again, we're, we've been focusing on education, but I know some of you, I mean, you, you, you work in different markets. Um, so I really wanted to hit on some state and local elements here. And primarily because with ARPA, it is, there, there's a lot of funding going to the state and local um, governments that what, it didn't, it didn't pan out that way in the CRRSA. There were some dollars that went to them in the care. So we saw some like city council chambers being updated so that they could stream their meetings and have, you know, um, emergency sessions to disperse information about like mask mandates, et cetera, and all of that kind of stuff. But the funding was pretty minimal for, for the state and local governments. With ARPA, there's, $360 billion going uh, to these entities. And to break it down a little bit, um, for the states, there's just shy of 220 billion that are going to state level governments. And that is um, 4.5 billion to territories. So 50% of that is going equally to all territories and the other 50% is going to be dispersed based on population. There's 20 billion going to the tribal government, so 1 billion um, equally to each, and then the remaining piece of that is going to be determined by the secretary who gets what. So probably much like a, a subgrant process. And then for the states, there's 195.3 billion going to the states and DC, and each are going to receive 25.5 billion equally, um, with DC getting an extra 1.25 billion. And then the remaining 168.5 billion is gonna be divided based on uh, unemployment rates. And those rates are determined um, three months prior to December, 2020 uh, date. So that fund uh, will start seeing and will start going out 60 days after um, the certification to the secretary. The secretary can then release um, up to 50% now. Um, and then we'll likely see 50% released in 2022. But you should know that these funds do not expire until December 31st, 2024. So ARPA is a multi-year act and plan. So it is a lot more dollars, but it, it is going to be, um, it is going to uh, expand out over multiple years. And not just with the state and local government, we'll see the same on the education stabilization fund piece. Okay, so let's let's dive into the cities here, cities and local governments. We got 46 billion going direct to cities, 20 billion going to what they call non-entitlement units. They're essentially the cities that aren't considered cities. Um, and then there's 65 billion going to the counties. And both the counties and uh, the, the cities, not called cities, that's all based on population. So, um, that you know, certain areas, certain counties are gonna get more because they're more populated, less populated, gonna get less dollars. And this distribution is half in 2021 and half in 2022, kind of like the state's piece. And then finally, there's capital projects. There's 100 million going um, to each state, 100 million to the tribal government, and then there's an additional uh, $4.4 billion out there that are going to go to capital projects. And that's going to be, again, kind of based on population, royal population, and low income. And again, I, this, is, this is high level information as we get more details on how they're going to funnel this out and who they funnel it out to. Um, we can share that with you. Um, just like in CARES and the CRRSA, we actually have files that show exactly what and how much each state received, exactly what and how much um, each higher ed institution received. And, and that's definitely some, um, some tools that we can share with you. Again, you can send me an email or I'll make sure that Stacy has them so that um, Herman can give them to you as well. So jumping back to the education stabilization funding, um, this is kind of a look at what, again, CARES versus CRRSA, which we've already seen, 
but those in relation to ARPA. So ARPA is, you know, $170 billion. So a lot more than CARES, um, over, you know, four, four times as much as CARES, about two, two and a half times as much as uh, the CRRSA, but this is over multiple years. Another thing that you'll notice is, again, huge emphasis on the ESSER K through 12. Um, higher ed's still gonna get more than what they received in the, the first two phases. And then finally, this little piece here, you'll notice that there's no more gear. So there is no more governor's education, emergency relief fund as it pertains to ARPA. There are, there's this other bucket that's going to outline areas, the Bureau of Indian and um, Education and education programs such as um, like the, the National Institute of the Deaf and, and other institutions uh, such as that will get funding. And this is, um, this actually came out from the Congressional Budget Office. They posted it on February 17th, and it's kind of a look of how they expect the ARPA be spent as it pertains, again, to the Education Stabilization Fund um, and, and kind of the trajectory of the spend. And because we just signed in to law not too long ago, the CRRSA, and those funds are going to be up after a year of distribution, um, they suspect that, you know, the amount of funding here is going to be a little less in 2021. We're going to see an uptick in 2022 and 2023, and then it'll gradually decline over the course of seven years. So what does that mean? Um, it means that there's roughly $284 billion actively in the market in education. Yes, some of that 30 billion of CARES is already spent, um, but it's still potentially still being integrated in. It's still you know, serviceable at this point in time. We have another $82 billion in the CRRSA that's gonna come through this year and trickle into the beginning of next year. And then we have the $172 billion in ARPA that will expand over the course of seven years. And I'm gonna stop there for a second because I need a drink of water and just make sure that we don't have any questions. So raise your hand, um, chat in, and, and Stacy will stop me and let me know what you guys are asking. Nothing? Oh, okay. I don't see any questions. You're doing so well, they don't have oh, any I questions. I hope so, I hope so. <laughs> If there's anything that you don't want to hear about too, chat in to Stacy and tell her to tell me to move it on. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I want to make sure that this is relevant and it's, you know, you're, you're walking away with, with something from this. So just tell me to move it on. So this next section is really about where, where's it all going? Where's all those dollars going? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, again, the, the trends that we're seeing, and then we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the solutions that we have at La Grande V, and again, available through Herman, um, in order to meet the needs of the schools based on the trends that we're seeing. So, we actually have some direct quotes from end users. And this, this first one says, try social distancing kindergartners gathered around during circle time. So here's a struggle from a K through 12 teacher, but this isn't, I, I mean, it, it's also pertinent, it's relevant to the higher ed spaces. Um, I, I'm sure you've seen, you know, if you've walked into universities, little X's on chairs saying you can't sit in these chairs to, to social distance. Social distancing is still going to be a thing now and, you know, in the future. How long in the future? Who knows? But even after a majority of us are vaccinated, I'm sure we're still going to see some social distancing until we all feel a little bit more comfortable getting close to each other again. So what does that mean? It means that we need to give everyone the best seat in the house. So pre-pandemic, there was obviously this increase in uh, display cells versus projection screens. And, and that's still probably uh, the case. We're probably still gonna see a lot of this, but think of it this way, that, that person that's in that fifth row, five seats over, um, that could see the display, 
uh, pre-pandemic may now need to be a three additional, you know, uh, rows back and 10 seats over more to abide by social distancing. And so where they're located now, they're not going to be able to see that display. And, you know, it might be to a size that we, we can't even find a display that size, or maybe the, it's a little bit too expensive. So we need to go to projection screens. So projection screens, not dead. We're definitely going to be seeing more and more projection projection screens um, in the education space in both higher ed and K through 12. Engagement. Here is obviously an issue and probably more so in the K through 12 space because they were not used to having to do anything remote before, right? You know, higher ed, they've, they've had a, a, an introduction into it. They've been doing it maybe a couple years, maybe not all classes, but you know, they're, they're at least equipped to be able to handle some of this. Uh, just that COVID has uh, projected them, you know, five to 10 years in the future. So they were able to use the federal funding to really, you know, integrate and, and equip the, the, all of their classrooms or a good bit of their classrooms um, for this distance learning, hybrid learning lecture capture that again, in five to 10 years, higher ed was probably going to go to anyways, just just for pure reach so that students in California that wants to go to a school in New York can. It's, it's dollars for that school in New York. It's a marketable thing for them. And it's definitely something that higher ed institutions, if they haven't been thinking about it, they're thinking about it now. For K through 12 though, you know, again, getting that engagement, especially when there's some remote or some hybrid happening, really difficult. And from this particular teacher, she said, when it comes to keeping my students' attention, you'd think my hands being tied would be the problem, but it's my feet. Hey, Kaylee, we do have a question yes. um, from the audience. Who are the typical people at the institutions making the decisions on how and where the money is spent? That's a really good question. And I'm gonna give you a pretty generic answer because it does vary by each school. Um, you know, I, there's, there's a school in Tennessee that they actually set up a team of folks that are in charge of CARES. They're in charge of the CRRSA. And basically as an internal process, um, there are different schools within the university. So, or different colleges like the College of Business, the College of Education, they will then do an internal grant process explaining why they need X amount of dollars to do X thing that they're trying to do. And they will submit those to this team of people. Um, in other schools, you know, it could be the, the IT team making a lot of the decisions there. So um, what we noticed in the first round and actually what we noticed a lot in the second round is that uh, some of the IT people though, even though they're making the decisions on maybe the gear that's going in, they didn't realize how much funding was out there. So once they became aware of it, and, and again, a great conversation for you guys to have with those higher ed institutions, once they were aware of it, then they knew who to go to to ask for that dollar. In some instances, it was a little too late for the first round. A lot of that dollars were already kind of delved out to you know uh, different areas, but they were they were prepared to ask for it in the second round. So a lot of times that's the IT team. Um, there may be an AV team subcomponent there. Um, so it could be those people. It could be the deans of colleges making um, those decisions. So maybe the university gets X amount of dollars, and then each college is going to get X amount of dollars, and then those deans are um, you know getting those funds basically and determining how those funds are spent. It's, it's just a mixed bag, um, which can make it complicated if, if you don't have the relationships today. But, um, you know, it's reach out. I would say my, my suggestion would be if, if you're trying to figure out who to go to, if you have a relationship or if you can search on, you know, the internet or whatever for someone in the IT department or if they do have someone in AV, that's a great place to start. Because if they're not aware of the funding and the amount that the school received, they're going to be super pumped about it and going to be super grateful to you. And then you can have that conversation with them and they can bubble it up to the appropriate people. Really great question. Thank you for that. Um, so 
back to the engagement piece here. So remember tying, tying your feet. Um, a lot of teachers, you know, they're just using their laptop or they're using webcams and they're carrying it around and you can see what the, what the students see remotely and that's just not ideal. So even in K through 12 spaces, um, we're seeing a lot of dedicated rooms or even mobile solutions where teachers can reserve those. And then of course, in higher ed spaces, just a, a multitude of classrooms being equipped with uh, PTZ cameras. That, that's really the best practice because they're gonna be able to get the view that you want. They're gonna be able to zoom in. You can use presets on PTZ cameras to go, you know, that the professor could say, I'm gonna be behind the lectern in this area. So let's preset lectern, uh, showcase me here. Now I'm gonna move over to the board. Let's go whiteboard area, PTZ over there. Even in K through 12, again, if they kind of reserve these units or have a dedicated room, maybe it's here's the board, here's our art area. And it's just really easy for, for the uh, teachers or professors to kind of hit the presets. And then the remote students are gonna get the full view versus what they might see here, which is just not very engaging, right? They're, they're missing out on a lot of it. And then let's go to interactive tools that drive engagement. So staying on the engagement topic here, and this is probably pretty, I mean, you guys probably are already aware of this and are already doing this, but moving from static content to the interactive content. So that can be interactive whiteboards, it can be interactive displays. And actually that's where I've seen a lot of the funding go for CARES in, in particular in the K through 12 space is with interactive flat panels and then um, the subsequent uh, accessories that they need for that, whether it be a cart or you know, a wall mount, um, the connectivity that, uh, that is required to be able to engage and, and, and actually make the flat panel work. But there are a lot of schools that are purchasing um, these, these interactive flat panels. You might've saw in the first wave, a lot of schools um, you know, purchasing uh, uh, Chromebooks and that kind of stuff. Well, with the second wave, they're likely going to be looking at this solution if they didn't with the first wave money. It's, it's definitely um, a trend that we are seeing. Productivity. So I'm constantly going from home to office to classroom. It's a nonstop activity. So this is, I mean, this is, again, relevant to K through 12, relevant to professors. Professors may be doing this as part of their actual curriculum where, you know, they're going to be at home or in their office um, delivering some content uh, and then, you know, maybe in class. Um, sometimes uh, with K through 12, it's likely because there's been a bump in, um, you know, COVID cases and now two weeks we got to go remote. So regardless of if it's built into the curriculum or if it's, uh, oh my gosh, okay, here we go, and making that transition, uh, the, the teachers, the educators really need to have the right gear at home, in their office, and in the classroom to be able to deliver um, the educational experience, to be able to teach. And so with that, we've actually seen a huge uptick in docking station purchases so that they can easily just connect in you know, their, their PC whenever they're at home or at work, and it just all works together. So outside of the teachers, what are we seeing from, again, maybe those IT teams, maybe those AV teams, what are we hearing? And what they're dealing with is communication and how we digest uh, that communication is really becoming more and more on the digital side. I mean, that's how we digest it on in our personal lives via our phones, our tablets. It, it's a really a, a digital world, right? So they are, you know, starting to do more and more digital signage and it can be informational, um, such as like, here's like customer communication. So think of this at a school where, you know, maybe the, the please wear your face masks, like that's, you know, whatever guidelines um, that they want to put on a digital signage experience um, to let people know when they enter, they need to be aware of this, right? Um, it could be safety protocols. So 
I know we're not personally allowed to travel right now, or we're, you know, we, we have to get special approval to be able to travel. And I have gotten special approval a couple of times and went to schools. Both of those times that I got special approval, I had to do a temperature check. So maybe it's a safety protocol station that they're trying to um, figure out and, and work through. It can be traffic control and that's in terms of wayfinding. So you are here and you need to go here. And, and so they're, they're just being tasked with communication, right? They're just being tasked with how to implement and roll out digital signage solutions um, across campuses, across, I mean, that's K through 12 campuses, that's higher ed campuses, and just relay the most relevant up-to-date um, information. And then another trend that we're really seeing is uh, the remote management trend. And this is probably more so targeted for higher ed than it is K through 12, but um, you know, they're responsible for the, the, the classroom, right? It needs to be up running and working when a teacher steps through that door. And that's a really hard task when you have hundreds of rooms. So remote management is being, uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely a piece that a lot of those teams at universities, um, they're, they're small. So this is something that they get really excited about. Part of the problem is that uh, that means that AV is on their network or, uh, you know, uh, a part of maybe a subnet or something like that. Um, so if the IT team isn't that team in charge of, you know, the classrooms, they got to get the IT team involved. And sometimes they're a little leery about this. Um, but again, there's, there's ways to, to get around that. So it's not directly on their, you know, core network. Um, you can do edge networks and, and all of that wonderful stuff. But this is definitely something that um, a lot of universities get excited about. This is something that like our camera systems, we have remote management pieces. Um, it's, it's free to download and it discovers all your Vadio solutions. And basically you can, you know, label each solution. You can um, put them in folders basically. So like building A, building B, and then building A, maybe it's, you know, room 101 camera, room 102 camera. So really cool tool to be able to just see everything um, right there on one screen. If you get a call and it's like, they can't see me, they can't see my video, you would be able to see the screen and see that the camera is blocked out. Basically, they muted the video. You can, that, that team could be a hero and click on that camera and voila, the camera is rolling again. They can do mass firmware updates from here and mass password changes too. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, with the Vadio deployment tool. And I'm sure there's other, you know, solutions out there where there's, you know, other network solutions, control systems and all of that that has kind of the same capability. We have something very similar in our rack link power too. Um, so this is just an intelligent power solution that you can, you know, remotely turn on and off uh, the, the gear. So it's the first thing that most people do when they troubleshoot, when they hear like, oh, I, this isn't working. What do you do? You turn it on. You, or you turn it off, you turn it back on, right? So we have solutions that can do basically something as basic as that all the way up to even more um, really cool management and monitoring capability, the ability to add in um, environmental sensors such as like temperature probes and that kind of thing. So if uh, the rack heats up to X degree, you can kick on a fan or it sends you an alert and you know that there's something potentially wrong with one of the pieces of gear. Um, we have a full range of that. But again, this, this remote management piece is really getting exciting for, for those small AVIT teams at universities. So I'm actually almost out of time, but I do want to go into um, one or two different spaces um, that, that kind of show our solutions for the trends. Um, but before I do, again, I kind of want to stop here and make sure that there's no questions um, that I've missed. I don't see any questions currently. Okay, good, good. Um, okay, so let's explore some spaces. Um, I'm just gonna jump over this real quick. Um, so these are diagrams that we have a newly uh, built solutions engineer team. They've worked hard with our marketing team and put together these wonderful diagrams that can be found on our site under 
lagrandev.com resources diagrams. You can find a whole slew of them. They're not just applicable to education. We have them for other markets. So if you do focus on other markets, you can find these um, pertaining to those relevant markets as well. And what the gist of these are that they're supposed to give you a baseline solution. We know how busy you are, especially if you're running with the, these education funds. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane right now for you guys. So we really wanted to help you out and give you a starting point. And that's exactly what these diagrams are. They may not be exactly what you need. And if they're not, um, you can call Herman, you can call us. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail on the solutions engineers in a, in a second. Um, you can utilize them. We can make adjustments here on these diagrams um, to make sure that, you know, maybe you have an extraordinary circumstance or a different kind of third party component and you want to make sure that it works with our gear. Um, we, we can manipulate these things for you. So again, just really a starting point. And what's really cool about them um, is that it ties in all of our Legrand AV brands. And if you click on uh, the, the landing pages, there's actually a PDF that you can click on too. Um, it talks about why we love it. There's actually even a, a section that's not on this slide, but it's called Kick It Up a Notch. And basically like um, in another instance in a small classroom, if you wanted to kick it up a notch, maybe you have triggers with like a, a, a step mat or an IR sensor for like hands-free control of camera presets. Um, so some cool little things that you could do if you wanted to have that kind of wow factor. Um, and then there's also a button to download into an Excel spreadsheet, the bomb that gives MSRP pricing too. So you can basically see what this solution would look like and how much it would cost from an MSRP standpoint. Then if you, you like that, you could always send that directly to Herman and, or to us and we can tell you what that price would look like from a dealer standpoint. So really cool resources. Um, I was gonna go into some of the um, products, but I, I, I really just don't have time. So I wanted to show you um, at least some of the solutions uh, that we have available. So that was the mobile solution. We've seen that a lot in the K through 12 space. Um, again, they just don't have the funds to equip every single room with um, BTC capabilities. So what they've been doing is, is basically doing more cart-like um, solutions that teachers then can reserve. This is for a more permanent install. And I do want to hit on this because this right here is by far the most popular layout that we saw last year. So a majority of classrooms are typically the same size. It's that small classroom. It's that 25 by 25, 35 by 35 space. This is the perfect solution for them. And we sold, oh my gosh, millions and millions of dollars worth of this little um, solution right here, which actually can be tailored to, you know, white or black. It's uh, one mic or two. We also have table mics available. You don't have to use our speaker if you don't want to. It's just a Phoenix connector on the back of the camera. And basically it's a USB camera with a 10 times zoom. It's our conference shot. It's amazing. It's, it's basically a solution in a bundle. It's one part number. It's easy to deploy. Um, and like I said, this is just our most popular layout that we saw um, in 2020. Uh, let's go on. Um, another layout that I do want to hit on um, is uh, the large classroom. And that's because um, it's our easy IP system. So I just wanted you guys to be aware that we are, uh, we've, we've launched products that are AV over IP products. So essentially these cameras, all of the, um, uh, all of the pieces plug into a network switch. Um, they go over IP. Uh, we have 10 and 20 times zoom camera. Um, the switch is available through Luxel. You do not have to use our switch if you do not want to. Um, these components, especially with our mixer, um, have the ability for Dante audio. We now have Dante um, ceiling mics, Dante table mics. You can see on our website, not quite available and same with Dante speakers. So making our four way into Dante technology here. Um, 
And then, you know, we, we suspect we started seeing this towards the end of 2020, where the easy IP system started kind of overtaking the conference shot AV system as far as popularity. And we, um, we imagine that we'll see the same this year too. So just more of an uptick on this easy IP, which is a really cool solution. So with that, I am actually going to jump clear down. You can see all these wonderful solutions that we have available for you. Um, but I do want to make you aware that if none of these are quite right for you or you're not sure which one might be right, you can meet with one of our experts. So at Legrand, we recently launched a complementary design services team of experts that are CTS certified, they're design engineers, there's application engineers, um, they're former educators and architects and even integrators. Um, and these two are that team. They are phenomenal. Again, they, they know third party manufacturers too, so they can make sure that um, if you're trying to piece in other um, pieces of the puzzle outside of Legrand AV products and solutions, we can tie those into those um, third party manufacturers. They're fantastic at it. Here's some of their output. Again, they, they did a lot of the, um, the solutions diagrams that I showed you before was their output. So you can have something that's like this, that is a little bit more visual. You can have an output that's more of a line diagram to show how everything actually connects. Um, it's, they're just a really cool resource that we've recently launched and, and it's available for you. You can work through your Herman team to get involved with them. You can work through, if you have, you know, a relationship with the LeGrand AV rep, um, you can reach out to them and they're able to get involved um, with the solutions engineer as well. On top of that, we have tons of um, market resources. So we have landing pages that have blogs, articles. So it's not just pushing our solutions. It's, it's really, um, really good content to educate yourself on what's going on in the market. Um, on the education standpoint, it's great information about CARE, CRRSA, and ARPA. Um, we do have the diagrams, we have videos, we have links to, you know, other um, AV industry articles and that kind of stuff too. So really good stuff. We have them on higher ed and K through 12. Um, and if you would like, uh, just if that's way too overwhelming <laughs> to you and you would like maybe my, my standpoint on what you should be looking at, this is my email. Feel free to email me. I can get you any of the information that we talked about today. And again, I'll make sure that Stacy at Herman has um, a few of our documents too that I, I reviewed and some of the tools so that if you do reach out to your Herman reps, they'll have that at their disposal as well. Um, and with that, I'm actually, I'm done. So what questions do you have? 